Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. So yeah, I'm going to speak about local energy dissipation for continuous and compressible Euler flows. Um, <clears throat> so I'll start with the, some motivation where I talk about Onsager's conjecture, how it comes from turbulence, the importance of local energy dissipation in this picture, and formulate the strong Onsager conjecture and uh, explain why it's important. Then I'll survey some previous results and uh, give you a tour of the construction of continuous Euler flows that exhibit local energy dissipation. So the, here are the Euler equations. I wrote, wrote them with the summation convention where you sum over repeated index like the index J. And uh, they can be derived in the form of a conservation law. Equations three and four express the balance of momentum and balance of mass over any region omega in space. And uh, so <clears throat> the balance of momentum uh, implies the uh, conservation of total momentum. If you take omega to be the whole space, there is no boundary. And you get that the total mo momentum in the whole space is a conserved quantity. Um, but you may think that for continuous solutions, they may not satisfy the conservation of energy. But when you prove the conservation of energy for Euler, you um, take the Euler equations, take the dot product with B, and you derive the local conservation of energy, which is this divergence form identity. And if you integrate that in space, you get the conservation of total kinetic energy. Of course, the local conservation of energy, which is supposed to hold point-wise, is a much stronger condition than conservation of total kinetic energy. So this place is a restriction on smooth enough Euler flows. But this computation requires some regularity, like the product rule to justify, and it's natural to ask, how much regularity is necessary for a uh, weak solution to conserve energy? In 1949, Onsager, Lars Onsager gave a conjecture about this problem. He stated that if you have a solution that has a Hilder exponent greater than one third, then the solution has to conserve energy. However, for alpha less than or equal to one third, there should exist solutions that fail to conserve energy. Okay. And uh, if you follow the argument on Sager was making, he didn't state this condition precisely, but he stated it and he didn't state this as a conjecture because he's a physicist. But if you logically follow his argument, you get a stronger conjecture on the existence of dissipative Euler flows, which is the following strong on Sager conjecture um, that there is should be a solution to the incompressible Euler equations, many of class C one third that satisfy local energy inequality. So, and with strict inequality for some test function. So not only should they dissipate energy, but there should exist C one third solutions that dissipate energy locally. And uh, the, this inequality has a simple physical interpretation. It's telling you that a physically admissible solution to Euler is everywhere prohibited from creating new energy. So this is a less than or equal. You cannot create energy in any region of space. Um, and you know this is the right condition because you can easily show that any vector field that arises as a zero viscosity limit from Navier-Stokes in L3 has to solve Euler and it has to satisfy this local energy inequality. So this is what happens in the limit to energy dissipation from Navier-Stokes. Um, so where does this exponent one third come from? And uh, where, why would we expect strict inequality, especially for solutions that arise uh, that are somehow physical solutions. Um, so the picture of, of uh, the answer comes from the study of turbulence, which th does lead you to think about solutions that dissipate rather than conserve energy. Um, so to give a cartoon picture, I'll summarize Kolmogorov's theory, which is the starting point of the theory of turbulence from 1941. And we're interested in what happens in the zero viscosity limit from Navier-Stokes because turbulence occurs when viscosity is small compared to characteristic lengths and velocities of the fluid. And the starting point of Kolmogorov's theory is that energy should dissipate at a rate that is strictly positive, independent of viscosity. So your typical turbulent flow will continue to, uh, to uh, dissipate energy at a rate independent of viscosity. So even though the friction is vanishing from the equation, you still have energy dissipation for some reason. And then the Kolmogorov's theory states that all the statistical properties of the turbulent flow should be deduced from the uh, scaling, scaling and the energy dissipation rate. For example, 
If you want to know how large are fluctuations in velocity, this theory says the difference in velocity will scale on average, <laughs> like distance to the one third. Was there a question? No. No. Okay. Okay. So, and this distance to the one third come from, comes from dimensional analysis because it's the only scaling law you can write down with dimensions of velocity where you have the energy dissipation right in there. And this law holds over all very large range of length scales, except for very small ones where the uh, solution should be more regular. So Onsager considered the case uh, without viscosity even. He, uh, he put forth a theory about how you could have this energy dissipation that is independent of viscosity. What is the mechanism for dissipation to be independent of viscosity? And he argued that even if you don't have friction at all, you could still have energy dissipation. And here's how he phrased his argument. Um, he thought about the, the solution in terms of a Fourier series. And if you expand the Euler equations in Fourier series, you say low wave numbers are interacting with higher wave numbers. So that means you can have some energy that starts out at low wave numbers and it cascades to higher wave numbers. This is called a, a, an energy cascade. So the energy can move from low wave numbers to a high wave number so fast that it can reach infinite frequency and vanish within a finite time. So this could happen even if there's no viscosity whatsoever. It's just driven by the nonlinearity in the equation. But he noted that you if, you, if you, a solution that dissipate energy would have to be low regularity and stated that uh, they could not be a solution could not be C alpha for alpha greater than one third. That would conserve, imply conservation of energy. He had an almost rigorous proof. Uh, however, he also gave a, an argument that the amount of energy at scale lambda for a typical turbulent flow should scale like lambda to the minus two thirds. So the, so the regularity of the solutions he's talking about <laughs> is exactly one third. Um, uh, so that gives you, so here we ha are talking about turbulent solutions dissipating energy with exactly the one third regularity. So that gives you the conjecture that for alpha greater than one third solutions would conserve energy, but for alpha less than or equal to one third, there should exist solutions that dissipate energy. How much do we know about this conjecture? Well, the conservation of energy for alpha greater than one third, we seem to understand quite well. Uh, things starting with work of Eink and Konstantin U and TT. Um, and the lesson is that if you should measure regularity in L3, and if you have slightly more than one third regularity in this base off space, that's enough to prove conservation of energy. But C one third is not enough to prove conservation of energy. So in principle, there could be C one third solutions that don't conserve energy. Um, now for the other direction, are there solutions that fail to conserve energy um, the, for alpha less than or equal to one third? This is a the harder direction. And furthermore, do they arise in the zero viscosity limit is an even harder uh, problem. And this last part implies the strong Onsager conjecture by compactness, strong Onsager conjecture that I mentioned before by a compactness argument. So let's look at the zero viscosity limit in more detail. Kolmogorov didn't think about his theory in the zero viscosity limit, but if you do, you, you see the following. There is some regularity that is independent of viscosity, uniform in viscosity. That gives you compactness, compactness in L2, which will, um, which will mean that as the viscosity goes to zero, you get a solution to the Euler equations. But this Euler equa solution Euler would not conserve energy, but rather dissipate energy if the energy dissipation is uniform in viscosity. And the only regularity it would have would be this one third regularity that you get that is uniform in viscosity. It would, of course, not be a smooth solution. So it's interesting that it took until 2012 for somebody to notice that K41 actually implies uh, the, the compactness of, in the zero viscosity limit. This seems to have first been observed by Chen and Glynn uh, 71 years after Kolmogorov's theory was put out. But OK, so let's formulate what I just said as a, as a conjecture, a folk, kind of folklore conjecture for Navier-Stokes that as, zero, as viscosity goes to zero, you should be able to find a sequence of Navier-Stokes solutions. And these are regular smooth solutions to Navier-Stokes, such that um, the C one third norms remain uniformly bounded and such that the energy dissipation rate remains strictly positive in the zero viscosity limit. Okay, so this is not about weak solutions to Navier-Stokes. It's about regular solutions to Navier-Stokes. 
but the but we can then take the limit as zero viscosity viscosity goes to zero and also notice that we're not talking about fixed initial data you should imagine a sequence of experiments at higher and higher Reynolds numbers so that you get different data the solutions and the data are smooth but they're becoming increasingly singular as viscosity goes to zero in this picture so what happens when we actually take the viscosity going to zero in this formal conjecture is we get the strong Ansager conjecture we get that the solution there's we for that solutions obtained in the limit have to uh, satisfy this local energy inequality and that's because the solutions to Navier Stokes satisfy this local energy equality if they're if they're nice enough where the right hand side as you notice is negative so when you take the zero viscosity limit you get something less than or equal to zero um <clears throat> yeah so the so and taking the zero viscosity limit of the conjecture i talked about for navier stokes you get the strong on conjecture that there is a c one third euler flow that satisfies local energy dissipation and uh that the proof just involves using the uniform bound on C1, the C one third norm and applying Aubin Leon Simon compactness limit. Okay, so here we have the strong on Sager's conjecture and notice the regularity is C one third. So that's not enough to show uniqueness in pr principle. There could be non-uniqueness of solutions at this regularity. Um, uh, and, but this is all, this is a very difficult question already is difficult to answer, are there even incompressible Euler flows that fail to conserve total kinetic energy? And the first answer to that came in work in, in both Schaeffer, Schaeffer in 93 and Schneerlman, uh, who produced solutions in the class L2 that uh, have compact support and uh, uh, also solutions that dissipate total kinetic energy. Um, but And then a sort of more systematic framework for constructing these with stronger results was given by Delalis and Sekalahidi produced, who produced bounded solutions that actually satisfy local energy dissipation. You can just prescribe the local energy dissipation rate to be any function of time. However, this, these solutions are nowhere continuous and the argument faces a big difficulty towards obtaining continuous solutions. Uh, but for uh, uh, this was resolved for alpha for uh, in 2012 by Delalis and Sekalahidi who produce solutions for C alpha for alpha less than one tenth that dissipate total kinetic energy. So this is the first result towards alpha equals one third, the first result uh, where you, towards Onsager's conjecture, where you can prescribe in fact the total kinetic energy as a function of time. Okay, so as I'll show you now, there's a lot we know about uh, dissipation of total kinetic energy. Starting this with this one tenth result, I improved the exponent <coughs> one fifth. Um, a shorter proof by Buckmaster, Delis, and Sekalahidi was given where they prescribed the kinetic energy profile. Um, uh, solutions L1 in time, C1 third minus epsilon were produced by Buckmaster, Delis, and Sekalahidi building on earlier work of Buckmaster. And uh, I, re I resolved the conjecture for, uh, for Onsager's conjecture. For all alpha less than one third, there are solutions with non-trivial compact support. And uh, a shorter proof was given by Buckmaster, Delalay, Sekele, Hidi, and Bicol, uh, where they prescribed the uh, total kinetic energy profile again. So the energy can be monotonically increasing or decreasing as long as it's sufficiently smooth. Uh, so I, I uh, optimized the proof to show how close you could get to the endpoint. The endpoint result should be true, but the method appears to be unable to do it. However, you can get this result where the regularity approaches the end approaches one third asymptotically at this rate, uh, this rate involving square roots of logs and double logs. So as the as the uh, as this length scale goes to zero, you get closer and closer to one third. Um, and uh, more re recently, there's this very interesting work of uh, Buckmaster, Masmudi, Novak, Bicol, and by Novak and Bicol that produce almost H one half. Uh, solutions. So, so if you re measure regularity in L2, you can actually go beyond one third. And this last uh, work of Novak and Bicol um, uh, produces solutions uh, in the base of space B3 one third minus infinity, which uh, result, which gives an alternative proof of Onsager's conjecture for in L3 based function spaces. So, the, so, so to summarize, we know a lot about 
dissipation of total kinetic energy. And what does that tell you about the tur turbulence? Well, it tells you that the, these energy cascades that Onsager is talking about really are admissible in the Euler equations. They, you can have energy dissipation driven by energy cascades that's consistent with this one third regularity. Um, the problem with all these constructions is that they all fail to satisfy the low local energy inequality. So they're all, they cannot be physically admissible solutions. They cannot be zero viscosity limits. Um, so we're, what we're left with is the strong Onsager conjecture that there should be solutions with this regularity that locally dissipate kinetic energy um, with some kind of strict inequality for some test function. Now notice that this problem is, a, this is a much stronger requirement than requiring dissipation of total kinetic energy. You can see all this already in the Berger's equation. For Berger's, the, the standard example non, of non-uniqueness is you can have a rarefaction wave or you can have a wave solution with a tiny shock. The solution with a tiny shock will still dissipate total kinetic energy, but it will not locally dissipate kinetic energy. And for Berger's or 1D conservation laws, one conservation, uh, one entropy condition that the local dissipation of energy implies uniqueness, whereas total dissipation of total energy does not. Um, so this is a much stronger requirement to ask for local, en the local energy inequality. It's a lot more rigid. Um, and what do we know about this? Well, the first examples, as I mentioned before, were bounded solutions that satisfy the uh, local energy dissipation, that you can prescribe the local energy dissipation to be any function of time. And moreover, you can uh, choose uh, this this uh, result came with a non-uniqueness result uh, by Delois and Sekalahidi that you can actually produce tons of them that that uh, generate from the same initial datum. You can there is a complete metric space for which a bare generic subset uh, satisfies the uh, the equation with the same initial datum, and they all satisfy this uh, local energy inequality. So you have a tremendous amount of non-uniqueness by this method, and this method is called uh, convex integration that produces these solutions. Um, uh, but but note these solutions are nowhere continuous. They're no better than L infinity. And uh, we want to have, for Onsager's conjecture, we want the solutions to be up to C one third. Um, so, and there's a difficulty in this proof that restricts you to be unable to produce continuous solutions. So we need a different method to produce continuous solutions. And that's what I'm talking about today, which is the first result on the strong Onsager conjecture that for alpha less than one over 15, there are solutions in C alpha that satisfy local energy inequality with strict inequality everywhere. And this inequality is in the sense of distributions because we're talking about things that are C alpha, of course, this take makes sense as a distribution and it's non-negative, non-positive in the sense of distributions. Um, and there's also a non-uniqueness result. This result is, is actually um, is as follows that they, you can have an infinite family with the same initial datum that have the same energy dissipation measure. I call this uh, D of VP, the energy dissipation measure. And uh, why is it interesting to have the same dissipation measure? Well, you might think that non-uniqueness of locally dissipative solutions arises because of some information that's lost in the zero viscosity limit. If you imagine they arise in zero viscosity limit. And perhaps you could recover that information if you knew the dissipation measure. And this, the fact that they all have the same dissipation measure suggests that you can't recover uniqueness from the uh, dissipation measure. And the non-uniqueness is even stronger. Um, you can prove that the non-uniqueness, uh, the non-unique solutions can locally conserve energy. So the dissipation, dissipative, uh, dissipation measure equal to zero. So they locally conserve energy. And you can make arrange that the house, the, you have a Cantor family of solutions with positive Hausdorff dimension. So what does that mean? The fact that it's a Cantor family of solutions means that there are no isolated points in this family. So that means there's no finite precision measurement that can restore uniqueness. They're not isolated solutions. There are no isolated points in this family. And furthermore, the solutions can be shown to have positive Hausdorff dimension. So this is uh, interesting for two reasons. For one reason, it's a stronger non-uniqueness result. Not only do you get, instead of a bare generic subset of a co complete metric space, you get an entire complete metric space and the metric space actually has positive Hausdorff dimension. Um, now uh, on, and uh, the, 
Um, and and uh, the other interesting part is that the way this positive Hausdorff dimension is proven is actually through a kind of probabilistic argument. You, what you do basically is you insert randomness into the construction at the right place. And this randomness produces a, a Frostman measure where if you uh, have, the, uh, have the right estimates, you show this uh, probability measure is a Frostman measure, which gives you a lower bound on the Hausdorff dimension. So this is the first application of probabilistic method to uh, convex integration. Um, uh, and uh, but uh, I'm not focusing on on that. The what I focus on is how you pr produce these continuous solutions that exhibit local en local energy dissipation. So, uh, but before I do that, I want to mention that this result has actually been improved by Delali Sinquan, who who improved the ex exponent from one fifteenth to one over seven, um, and uh, they they. Uh, Jiri and Kwan have extended this to isentropic compressible Euler. And the idea is to discretize the Mikado flows that Donary and Sekai introduced that were also used in the proof of Unsager's conjecture. Um, and the open problem now is to improve the regularity to one third. Okay, so one seventh is now the is now the record. Okay, so how do you show there exists continuous solutions that locally dissipate energy? Well, so here's the Here's the outline for the rest of the talk. I'll give the general idea of constant of convex integration using so-called one-dimensional waves that were introduced in my paper with Vlad. And this will show you how to produce continuous solutions. And then uh, I'll introduce the ideas for local energy dissipation, how the proof of that works, uh, which are dissipative Euler-Reynolds flows. There's an arrow of time in the construction, which is new to have an arrow of time in the construction. and uh, Trilinear energy cascades play a big role, and this is something that's much like a theory in the physics literature called the LDIA theory by Krugman. Um, okay, so how do we produce continuous solutions? Forget about local energy dissipation, but produce continuous solutions to Euler. Um, so we start with solutions to the Euler-Reynolds equations, and these are this is the Euler equations with a forcing term that's the divergence of the symmetric tensor R. And this symmetric tensor R measures the error from solving Euler. If R is equal to zero, then you get a solution to the Euler equations. And you can easily show that any continuous Euler flow is a limit of smooth Euler-Reynolds flows. So it makes sense to try to construct a continuous solution by constructing a sequence of smooth Euler-Reynolds flows. And there are tons of Euler-Reynolds flows to, to choose from. So that's the idea. Make a sequence of Euler-Reynolds flows where the error gets smaller and smaller. So to get from the qth velocity to q plus one, we add a high frequency correction vq and a correction to the pressure capital PQ. And these corrections are designed to get rid of the error and make the new error way smaller. When the new error is way smaller, we repeat this procedure over and over and the error will go to zero in the limit. And the corrections we add will get smaller and smaller as well. So this whole series will converge uniformly uh, to a solution to the Euler equations where the error equals zero. So that's the idea. Just add these corrections to make the error smaller and smaller. So that's the basic idea of uh, a convex integration. So we'll just focus on one step of that sequence where we start with an Euler-Reynolds flow. We add a correction capital V and a correction capital P. We get a new velocity and pressure, and the, the new error is supposed to be a lot smaller. So our new velocity v star and new pressure p star solve the Euler-Reynolds equations, but now the new error is supposed to be way smaller. Okay, so that sounds very general. That get <coughs> the error smaller, but then um, <clears throat> when you try it, you realize there's big difficulties because the error is supposed to be the divergence of a small tensor, but it's either something that's not the divergence of a symmetric tensor, or you get terms that are divergence of symmetric tensor that is not small. So the game, part of the, an important part of this procedure is to uh, solve the divergence equation to get the new, the new error. And it's only after you choose your corrections, capital V and P very carefully that you can cancel out this R. And then after solving the divergence equation, the new R will be smaller than the old R. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the game plan um, to uh, add the corrections and try to cancel the error. And uh, 
so how how sm how small is the error going to be? Well, if the my high frequency correction, if it oscillates at frequency lambda, I want the new error to be of size one over lambda. After I solve the divergence equation to to uh, to uh, to find it. Okay, so then we we get three kinds of terms. First one is linear. It's called the transport term. It's linear in the correction capital B. And then we get nonlinear terms where we have the the quadratic interactions of your correction that have low frequency and high frequency parts. And all these solutions should be of, all, all these terms should be of size one over lambda after solving the divergence equation. And there's another error term that arises because you have to regularize the velocity field and stress, um, but we'll be ignoring that term. What does the correction look like? So we'll, we'll talk about a correction uh, of an ansatz I outlined with Bicol, uh, and uh, a, the correction looks like this. It looks like a high frequency lambda wave with an amplitude vi. We get to pick the phase function. We get to pick the amplitude, but we need to make sure that our wave is divergence free. So we add this tiny correction delta v to make it divergence free. And the 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 phase functions are transported by the coarse scale flow, so they are nonlinear phase phase functions. And our constraint to make sure we have a divergence free vector field is that the amplitude is orthogonal to the phase gradient. Other than that, we're free to choose the amplitude. And uh, to, to, to be more precise, we, um, we can arrange that the wave has, uh, is, project, is localized in frequency. So we take a Lorray projection and localize in frequency to get this, uh, to get this formula for the wave. OK. And uh, now another tool we use is the microlocal lemma that says that when you put in a high frequency wave into a convolution operator, that convolution operator acts like a Fourier multiplier. And this is a, an application of Taylor expansion and you get a nice estimate on the error that you get from uh, plugging in a high frequency wave into a convolution operator at frequency lambda. So that gives you the wave. Uh, it's this convolution operator applied to a frequency lambda wave. Now, let's look at the main term, plug it in, and see what error terms we get. Uh, we get uh, we want all of them to be of size 1 over lambda. We, let's look at the transport term to see how that works. The transport term involves the evective derivative applied to the correction, which is scary because you're differentiating a high-frequency function. But because our waves are carried by the flow, this evective derivative does not hit the phase function, but only hits the amplitude. Now you have something low frequency times something high frequency. And when you solve the divergence equation, you gain 1 over the frequency. So you get a solution of size 1 over lambda. And that solution will live at frequency lambda. So the linear term is high frequency. And now we have to worry about the uh, nonlinear term. The nonlinear term is the quadratic interaction of the, the correction with itself. So you have all these waves that are multiplied by each other. And you want to isolate the low frequency part and use it to cancel out the low frequency part of the error. Now, what's the low frequency part? When I have a plane wave and multiply it by its complex conjugate, I get something low free frequency. In fact, the phase functions cancel out, and I just get the squares of the amplitude. So I get the sum of the squares of the amplitude, which is a positive definite tensor that I get to control because I control the amplitudes. So I can pick the amplitudes pointwise so that this is any positive definite tensor I want. And using the pressure, I can get negative definite tensors too, or whatever uh, tensor I want. So we can cancel out the low frequency part of our epsilon pointwise. I set this pointwise equal to 0. So it's kind of like taking a square root of this, uh, of this stress to define the amplitudes. So the low frequency out part cancels to 0 pointwise. And I'm left with the high frequency interactions between the waves, which are all the other interactions. Now, something nice happens here. Well, hopefully, it has to happen because you're differentiating a high frequency phase function that gives you a terrible power of lambda. So unless there's some cancellation, you, you are doomed. Oh, well, the, the, what do we need for cancellation? We've got the dot product of the amplitude vi with the phase function, and that should be equal to 0, which it is. But when you take the dot product of the amplitude with the other phase function it's interacting with, that, intera that intera dot product is not equal to 0 unless we impose that it is. So we want, we want somehow all the amplitudes to be orthogonal to all the phase functions. And this could be possible if your phase gradients all point in the same direction. So if we point, ha have the phase gradients all in the same direction, then the amplitude is restricted to that hyperplane, but we have this orthogonality. Now, 
um, okay, that that's good. That takes care of this high frequency term, but it messes up what we were trying to do before, which is cancel out this low frequency part of the error. Now we're restricted to hyperplane, so we can only get rid of the part of the error in the hyperplane. So we're left with two components that are restricted to other hyperplanes. So that means that we have to do this over and over where we get rid of the second component, get rid of the third component. And after you iterate this procedure three times, the error is finally smaller. So that is basically the tour of how you produce continuous solutions. You uh, get rid of each component of the error. After three tries, the error is smaller, and then you uh, continue the iteration. So this is a, an improved version from the one-dimensional uh, uh, construction that I outlined with, with Vlad Vicol. Um, okay, so that's basically how you produce continuous solutions, a, a, a cartoon summary of it. Now, um, we want to produce solutions that not only fail to conserve energy, but locally dissipate energy. So how, now I'll talk about how to do this. Um, so we, the idea, the starting point is we want to get the error, the dissipation uh, of, the, of the solution to be less than or equal to zero. So the idea is in the same way we relax the Euler equations, we allowed for an error term. We could allow for an error term in the uh, local energy dissipation. And then we could try to design a scheme where not only do we cancel out the error R, but we cancel out the error F. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the hope is that we can cancel out these two error terms at, at a, the same time, but it doesn't actually work this way. But this, this kind of idea won't actually work. But uh, there is, however, a correct way to relax the equation that, that will work, which is the following. It's the notion of a dissipative Euler-Reynolds flow. So we have an Euler-Reynolds flow, which means there's an error in the Euler equation, but there's also an error in the local energy inequality. So there's a, it, we want the approximate dissipation to be less than or equal to. And there are three error terms, the advective derivative of kappa, that's the unresolved density, and then the divergence of uh, V contracted with the stress R. So there's a coupling between the Euler-Reynolds equation and the error for the local energy inequality. And there's an unresolved current phi. And what we want to do is we want to design a scheme where we have three error terms, kappa, r, and phi, and we want to get rid of all three error terms simultaneously. That's the plan. So start with an Euler-Reynolds flow, uh, dissipative Euler-Reynolds flow, which means that we have this relaxed local energy inequality, and add high frequency corrections. And we want to get rid of the kappa, make it smaller, make the r smaller, and make the phi smaller for our next uh, approximate solution. OK, can we do that? So this, this uh, script D is the left-hand side of the lo this local energy inequality. Um, lo what's going to happen when we add corrections? Well, D is something that's quadratic and cubic at the same time. So there are going to be quadratic interactions, and then there are also going to be uh, cubic interactions. Uh, and there are, so there will be many terms, and we want them all to be uh, of this form. That's uh, the advective derivative plus divergence of V contracted with R plus divergence of phi um, for the for small kappa R and phi. Let's so here's here's a tour of the error terms, the uh, the terms that are linear in the correction. I call the transport term. The term there are low frequency quadratic interactions. There are high frequency quadratic interactions. There are quadratic equations that interact with the um, the density, and there there are trilinear interactions. Then interacts with the uh, that interacts with the current, and we want to do is get the error r, kappa, and phi all to be small at the same time. And uh, so let's see how we get these error terms to be small, starting with the transport term. And I think of this process as digging because you'll you'll see that uh, you want to get this term to look like it has the right form, and the the structure of the relaxed local energy inequality is is key. So let's look at this term. The first step to do is to take our velocity field and regularize it. So we reg mollify the velocity field, and doing so produces the advective derivative of some kappa plus the divergence of some phi. So that's uh, OK as part of our error. And then we, we look at this error term, and we start applying the product rule. And what, what we see in the transport term is something familiar. We see divergence of the transport's part of the stress. 
This is familiar. And we see what is basically the left-hand side of the Euler-Reynolds equation, also familiar. And when I look at this, I get V contracted with the divergence of R plus the correction contracted with the divergence of something low frequency. Now, this is almost what I want. I want a divergence of V contracted with R. So I'm going to take the divergence on the outside and say, oh, this is good. This is part of the error that I want. And then the rest of the terms are hopefully OK. And the reason they're OK is that they all have frequency lambda. So because they have frequency lambda, they can be absorbed into the divergence of phi by solving the divergence of equation, which gains a 1 over lambda. So all the error terms have the right form. And this, uh, this term gives you an example of how to see that. So that's now let's talk about how to actually get rid of these new error terms. We want to get rid of the kappa. We want to get rid of the phi by using quadratic and trilinear interactions. Let's start with getting rid of the, uh, the current phi using trilinear interactions. The idea is we want a bunch of a, a certain group of these waves to have low frequency cubic interactions that cancel out the low frequency part of the current. So there's a certain collection of waves that have low frequency trilinear interactions. They're going to cancel out the low frequency part of the current uh, because the, when, when they interact with each other, you get the sum of the cubes of the amplitudes, this cubic form. And I get to choose the amplitude. So I can get my, make my amplitude whatever I want. And I can cancel out at least the component of phi restricted to a hyperplane. And what this looks like is, uh, is the Lagrangian direct interaction approximation theory of Crichton. Crichton uh, proposed this theory where the cascades of energy and turbulent flow are controlled by uh, tri trilinear interactions of waves that are carried by the mean flow. And that, this is sort of the first rigorous uh, construction of mathematical solutions that look like that. Um, then there are also high frequency interactions, and there's a special cancellation that allows you to absorb these into the current. And now we can, uh, um, but so, so that this is, uh, this is going well, we cancel out the current. And this is interesting because this is the first cubic convex integration scheme. All, all previous convex integration schemes are just quadratic. And now we want to, uh, now that we've canceled out phi, or at least part of it, we want to cancel out the kappa, the density, using in quadratic inter interactions. So we, let's look at this term and decompose it into low frequency and high frequency interactions. We want the low frequency interactions to cancel out kappa, and we take care of the high frequency interactions later. The low frequency interactions, you get the uh, sum of the squares of the absolute values of the amplitudes. And those should cancel out kappa. Well, of course, they can't do that unless kappa was were negative. So somehow we need kappa to be negative to cancel it out. So what, what do we do? Well, we can subtract a function e of t to make sure this guy is negative. But by what we, what we subtract, we also have to add. And here you see the arrow of time, because as long as e of t is non-increasing, which, which uh, makes sense given that we're trying to make energy dissipating solutions, then you can absorb that the advective derivative of E into the relaxed local energy inequality. So you see the arrow of time in this convex integration scheme. And then after we absorb that into the inequality, we can cancel out the kappa, or at least it looks like it. But there is a problem is that the equation for kappa is interacting with the equation for R. You see the quadratic form here. The trace of this quadratic form, one half of that, is, is right here sitting in the equation for kappa. So somehow we have two equations that conflict with each other. But there's a way to resolve this conflict using the pressure. There is a unique choice of pressure so that these two equations can be solved at the same time. So we define the pressure correction to equal exactly that function. And then both the equations are satisfied. So we got rid of kappa. We got rid of r. But there is another problem, which is that our amplitude, we're using the amplitudes to get rid of phi. And we're also using the amplitudes to get rid of r. And we're sort of using the amplitudes to do two things at the same time. So how do we resolve this? Well, I'm going to take the amplitudes that are being used to get rid of phi. That's part of the sum. I'm going to put, move them to the right-hand side. And then I'm going to use the rest of the waves to get rid of r. And they're going to cancel out these terms that are used to get rid of phi as well. So I'm moving phi, sort of the cube root of phi, uh, the sum of the squares of the amplitudes to the right-hand side. And this idea is OK as long as your phi 
to the two thirds is lower order. As long as this is a lower order term, it's okay to do this. And but this does jeopardize actually the success of the whole scheme because in order for phi to be lower order, you need to look at all the terms and make sure that they truly are lower order. And there are terms that distress you because they don't quite look like they're lower order right away. For example, the interaction of the velocity with the pressure um, is a is a dangerous term. It it has it, it points in the correct hyperplane for the scheme to work, but it actually has a size that is too large um, to be considered a lower order term. And at this point, it's kind of terrifying because we've spent all of our degrees of freedom. We chose all our amplitudes. We chose all our phase functions. If this term is too big, then we're stuck and the whole thing doesn't work. But thankfully, there's kind of a miracle that even though this term is apparently too big, the divergence of this term has a special cancellation. When you take the divergence of this term and similar terms, you see, you get a, a factor lambda, which is bad, but you get an interaction where these tensors are contracted with each other. That is good. This main term actually cancels out to zero. So the divergence is smaller than you think it is. And because of that, we can solve the divergence equation and absorb it into the new current. So that means that uh, this term uh, can actually be safely put into the new current. And all the terms that are dangerous have the structure where their divergence looks OK. And then they can be absorbed safely into the new error. So we made the current smaller. We made the stress smaller. We made the um, <coughs> kappa r and phi smaller. And we are, so we are uh, done. We just iterate that over and over again. And uh, that is uh, the idea of the proof. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil, for your questions. Stefano? Um, so uh, I want to ask a question. Maybe you mentioned something uh, and I missed. Uh, so can you prescribe uh, the dissipation measure? Uh, so can you take also some dissipation measure, which is uh, like positive or? Um, uh, so the uh, do you, do you mean as a function of time and space? Yes. So I mean, so in this usual construction for the for the dissipation of the total energy, you can allow your energy to be increasing or decreasing or whatever you want, essentially. So it's a, so if you can do the same with the time and space. Uh, okay. So what? Um, okay. So if you just if you have if you if you're just concerned with the energy as a function of time, I think that the uh, De Lellis and Kwan's paper does that as long as you're bounded away from zero. So their, their scheme doesn't give you energy going to zero. Um, but if you want the energy dissipation measure as a function of time and space, this is a very rigid requirement. And I haven't thought about it very hard, but it seems like uh, it would really require some involved thinking to see if you could actually do that, and it's possible the answer is no. But can you see that? Uh, sorry, may, may I ask? So, okay, so can you see that in the proof? So, I mean, so in some point where, like, uh, so we are really using that uh, there is a less or equal. Um, so, in the proof, what we need is E of t to be large enough. Um, uh, so that, and then we, and then the uh, the advective derivative here has to be less than or equal to. Okay, yeah, so this, this, is, this is not not going well for your question because it seems like you have to control the advective derivative of this function you added, whereas the whole point of the function you added was to be sort of large enough. Um, and I, uh, I, I don't have the best control over the advective derivative of that E. So it's not looking favorable, but maybe there's a way of uh, looking at it that uh, it could work out. You can get it to be zero. Notice that if you uh, if you just have e of t to be a constant, then this is zero. Then uh, uh, then you this is how the local energy local energy conservation proof goes. So uh, at least you can set e of t equal to a constant and the, the dissipation measure equal to zero.
something uh, that may be related to Stefano's question. You have these three defect terms <coughs> in, the, uh, in the iteration. And uh, uh, I mean, so for instance, the Reynolds defect term comes as a precise closure. So any, any defect term arises as a weak limit. Uh, is there something like that for, for, the, um, for the energy equation? If yeah, see, yeah. So if you uh, take uh, if you take weak limits of uh, let's let me find the uh, definition of a I'll, I'll find it in a second. Okay, so here's the definition. So if you take weak limits of something that satisfies the local energy inequality, then you can consider uh, cumulants. For those weak limits, and the weak limits will be a dissipative Euler Reynolds flow, where kappa is half the trace of the R, and the phi is something that arises from sort of cubic uh, defect measures. My question is more the opposite. So, given a kappa R and phi, can you construct a sequence? They don't have to be exact solutions, but something that converges weakly. Uh, Let's see. So there, there's a kind of a there, there's kind of a relationship between kappa and R, which is that kappa is let's let's ask that kappa let's require that kappa is one half of the trace of R. You can arrange uh, in in Delalis and Quan's proof they always assume that kappa is half the trace of R, and in in my proof I think that can also be arranged. Uh, so let's say kappa is half the trace of R. Um, then, then can you? Uh, uh, yeah, I. Uh, there might be a constraint on the size of phi. Uh, you might need to know that phi is small compared to r. Um, because when, it, it, because the way you're talking, the proof that. The, the, in the Euler case, you, you want to not add, uh, you sort of want to avoid using the pressure. Um, so then you need R to be sufficiently negative definite to start with. And then if you're not going to use uh, a, uh, if you're not going to use part of the pressure to make your solution bigger, then, then phi is going to be, uh, it might have a constrained size compared to R. You might need to be phi to be the sort of the two thirds, phi to the two thirds might need to be small compared to the uh, size of your negative definite tensor R. So maybe you don't exactly get arbitrary kappa R and phi, but maybe you get kappa R and phi subject to the size restraint on the, on the R. And I think that would also be, yeah, uh, that, that, that's my initial thought. Mm -hmm. Okay, it seems there are no more questions. So thank you very much, Phil.